I am at. So thank you once again for joining us this evening. Can we just quickly give another round of applause there to the Africa Sian Ngoba Choir? This is uh, the 10th Matthew Goniwe lecture, memorial lecture that we'll be listening to a bit later on. The premier of the province, uh, Panyazali Sufi, will be looking at and reflecting on a decade of Matthew Goniwe, but also looking at some of the lectures that have taken place previously, and also reflection that is required when it comes to the lectures. Like I said on Wednesday, is... Matthew Bonnewe was not just a science teacher, was not just a maths teacher, but he was also an activist. And we know um, the Premier, of course, who's the former MEC for Education, also played an activist role when it comes to the role that he was playing as the MEC for Education. The question that comes is, what role are you playing as an activist? as we try to change the world that we live in, also the generation that we are going, generations, because it's a plural, right? The generations that we are going to be leaving behind. I'm going to ask us now to please stand, and um, we will be singing the South African National Anthem, which will then be followed by the AU National Anthem. I'm going to ask now the choir to come to the fore, to come and give us a rendition of the South African national anthem that is positive vibrations.
please remain standing as we sing the AU anthem. Well done, well done, well done, ladies. Um, there is the positive vibrations, the art of hope for girls. Thank you so much for that rendition. And I just quickly want to make some acknowledgements before we start the program. Um, the Premier of Gauteng, Honorable Banyaz Ali Sufi. The MEC for Education, Honorable Madhum Kwani. The Matthew Goniwe School of Leadership and Governance Board of Directors the Matthew Gonyue family and representatives of the Cradle community, the CEO of Saibono, that is Professor Ntobi, Mr. A.B. Vidboy, the chairperson of the Saibono Board of Directors and all of the Board of Directors of Saibono. We also want to acknowledge the executive of the Gauteng City Region Academy and executive members serving in the Board of Management team. Also acknowledging 
this evening the MD of a Global Research Council for the Global Research Council, that is a Professor King Costa. We also want to acknowledge various research institutions, um, including members of the Global Research Council and the Center Emerging Research based at the University of Johannesburg, members of the private sector, including Vodacom as well as MTN. Let's give them a round of applause and thank you so much for joining us this evening. So as I was saying that on, uh, on Wednesday, we had a breakfast business colloquium that was put together by the Matthew Goniwe um, School of Governance and Leadership, speaking about some of the important issues that relate to education. Today, we are going to further that conversation as we hear a bit later on from the executives of the, uh, from the executives of the Matthew Goniwe School of Leadership, School of Governance, as well as Leadership, but we'll also be receiving some entertainment. And by the way, there is what we call the voice of God. You know when you attend events and then there's just this voice that you don't know where this voice is coming from. And the voice of God that we have this evening is um, Dineo. You will be hearing from Dineo a bit later on. That is our voice of God. In the meantime, let me call on to the podium um, the Africa Sun Global Choir to give us one more item before we hear from the CEO of the Matthew Goniwe School of Governance and Leadership.
Oh, doesn't that rendition take you back to the funeral of uh, former President Nelson Mandela? I don't know if you guys remember that scene. Um, very emotive. Um, thank you so much there to um, the team there, which is the African Obaya. Well done. Thank you so much for um, the emotion that you bring to the song as well and the essence of that song. Really appreciate it. We are now going to call on the CEO of the Matthew Goniwe School of Leadership and Governance. We're going to ask Ubabu Sbusiso to come and join me on the podium. Director, good evening and thank you very much. Uh, greetings to our Premier. Honorable Panyaza the Sufi, uh, MC for Education and Counting, Mr. Matume Chilwan, HOD, the newly appointed HOD, Mr. Rufus Mutlana, who is the former holders. <laughs> <laughs> uh, our keynote speaker, the first MC of Counting Education, Professor Mary Metcalf. The Board of Directors of Metu Kono School of Leadership and Governance, led by Mr. Tedi Soletimo. The Konoe family, led by Mr. Nyaniso Koniwe and the Credo community. The Board of Saipono Science Discovery Center, led Mr. Vetboy. Management and staff of Metu Konue School of Leadership and Governance. Also want to acknowledge the CEO of Saipono, Professor Ntobi. We do appreciate your presence here. It shows we're working together as a team. Members of SGP associations present. Uh, leadership of GDE. Uh, unions, distinguished distinguished guests, uh, ladies and, and gentlemen. It is a privilege and honor to stand before you tonight and to officially open the 10th lecture uh, of the Meju Koniwe School of Leadership and Governance. This year we're celebrating 21 years of existence, but due to unforeseen circumstances, we could not always hold the memorial lecture every year. And I wish to state uh, this upfront with thanks to you, Premier. As a chairman back then, in 2007, 2008, you insisted that we need to honor the memory of Metu Koniwe. And when you came back as an MEC, you said you must hold an annual lecture. And I think we've kept uh, to what you've instructed us to do. Uh, over the years, we've had we've held these lectures, and the topics that we always, or the themes of the lectures, are always topical issues of the moment. The first was held in 2004, and the theme of the lecture, or the title of the paper that was presented by the then uh, Director General of Education, Mr. Tamsang Hamselegu, was the role of education in the transformation of South Africa. A and I think we are back there, given the theme today, which is transform transformational leadership in changing society. So there is a thread. And given the, the mandates that we've been given by the EU Premier and Embassy afterwards, a in that lecture, the second paper was presented by the executive director of CETA, which was looking at alternative, alternatives and complementaries uh, schooling to the existing tertiary education. And if you recall, those who were present on Wednesday, who Mr. Sizwing Masane did hint or allude to the role that universities play, that they are not producing graduates that are ready to serve the economy. So as, as far back as 2004, 
uh, these are the discussions that we were already having. But unfortunately, we take very long to implement. I'm glad to say we're back on track towards repositioning Umetu Koniwa School of Leadership and Governance as a tertiary education institution. And this will be to close the gaps that universities are unable to close in making sure that uh, our ECT practitioners are well qualified to service the sector. There were other lectures that will have followed, and they are all within the spirit of this organization. 2008, we partnered with the Steve Biko Foundation uh, to deliver a lecture. That lecture was, uh, uh, the keynote was presented by Professor Lungisile Nsebeza. Uh, as part of, again, trying to expand to other provinces in 2009, the lecture was held in PE, Nelson Mandela University. That one was addressed by Professor Mbule Elonzaman. Uh, then there was a break that can't be explained between 2009 and 2011. But in 2012, uh, Professor Matkaf uh, presented a paper, and during this period, it was the time when the foundations that are in the education sector were very vocal, uh, given the challenges that textbooks were not delivered, uh, toilets were not uh, to, the lev to the acceptable level in a number of schools in the country. And the title of the paper was, Is Access to Education as Enshrined in the Bill of Rights Unconditional, a Realistic Goal or a, pi or a Pie in the Sky? And again, the, those foundations were invited uh, 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 to the lecture. And it, it just shows we don't shy away from critical issues that are facing the sector, but we seek to address them head on. In 2018, the current Minister of Basic Education, Minister Inge Moteka, uh, presented a paper titled, The Pursuit of Excellence in Learning and Teaching in the 21st Century. Uh, this was at a time when there was integration of ICTs in the education sector. That particular lecture was followed by the one in 2019 uh, that looked at the living legacy of Matthew Goniwe, uh, future teachers of excellence advancing the fourth industrial revolution era. So that was the continuation of the lecture that was delivered in, 20, in 2018. Uh, the other lectures, unfortunately, were overshadowed by the National Teacher Awards up until the point the board of Matthew Goniwe decided that these lectures must be standalone uh, events rather than be coupled with the, 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 the teacher awards. But in 2022, advocate Tembe Gang presented a paper, and the theme was Bridging the Social Economic Inequalities of the Past Through Effective School Leadership and Governance, Inevitably Providing the Efficiency and Quality of Education. And here we are today, uh, the theme being transformational leadership for change in society. And I wish to declare this particular lecture open and enjoy uh, the, the, the speakers. I think we've got a good lineup of speakers. The uh, program director has already introduce them. I think I'll be spoiling it if I take it any further. Enjoy the evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. That is uh, the CEO of the Matthew Gonyue School of Leadership and Governance. And by the way, I don't know if, um, CEO, you are downplaying it this time around. Because on Wednesday, um, guests who were not at the breakfast colloquium is that the CEO was speaking about 21 years of existence of this particular institution. 21 years of existence of this particular institution. The dreams and hopes that they have to take this institution to a national level and to also establish it as an institution of higher learning. And by the way, um, Premier and MEC, he also said that 1.5 million lives 1.5 million lives have been touched 
by this particular organization. So congratulations. I'm now going to call on to the podium the board chairperson, Tediso Lidum. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director Aldrin, and good evening. Let me also follow suit from where the CEO left off and do the welcome. And as I do, let me extend my word of welcome to our Honorable Premier, Honorable Panyazali Sufi, the MEC for Education, Honorable Matume Chilwane, the newly appointed Head of Department, Rufas Mutlana, the family of Goniwe and the head of delegation here present. We really do appreciate your coming, as you always do every year. The guest speaker is invited, who will be giving us the lecture later on. The board and members of the executive and staff of Matthew Goniwe School of Leadership and Governance, all stakeholders in education and business partners, all of you invited guests. It is my pleasure to really welcome all of you this evening to this lecture. This lecture is held annually as per the resolution of the board because we understand the magnitude of the task that we have to perform in providing the necessary oversight to the institution. We not only understand the magnitude of ensuring that all those who undergo our training programs go back empowered, but we also understand that we carry the name of a giant and therefore have a responsibility to ensure that we keep his legacy living and sustainable. Chairperson, the institution has survived five terms of the democratic government under the leadership of five MECs, two of them are here, uh, who once led the department with diligence, with vision, throughout the 21 years of existence the institution traversed a very complex route. As you would know, that in our country we have had to overhaul the curriculum, deal with the training backlog, particularly teachers who were very poorly trained by the then regime. It was a huge task. We have also had to train school governing bodies because the democratic government had put a new dispensation We've also had to train representative council of learners because a new dispensation had come to bear, destroying the old oppressive uh, prefect system. This institution has done this work for the past 21 days, navigating all the changes that came with it. And in that process, we had the teacher at the center whose responsibility is to mediate teaching and learning. And therefore, this institution as a training arm had to execute that, that task to ensure that the impact of the training that we do reaches the learner. And although we don't have scientific tools to prove the impact of our programs, MEC, I can boast that uh, the good results that we get every year is how they we are making a contribution as Matthew Konewa School of Leadership and Government. <laughs> we truly believe that, uh, and I'm one of those vis a -vis the percentage. You know, if you have 10 learners and they all pass, it's 100%. If you have 50 learners and you get 50%, 25 has passed. So who has made a contribution? <laughs> so I always argue 
that uh, when we do analysis, we must be thorough and comprehensive. And, and that's why we post the results that we always get as Gauteng Department of Education. All we do is to provide oversight and ensure that our programs are de delivered, underpinned by our vision. And our vision is very clear, is that we want to be a leading training institute, not only in the country, but beyond. We do so by providing quality training programs quality training programs so that we are able to see the results that are envisaged by the Department of Education and the Department of the Day. The Education Transformation Project is a very complex one. For all the years, all the MECs have seen the need for the continued existence of Matthew Gonewa School of Leadership and Governance. And we really want to commend the staff that we have had over time, including the current staff under the leadership of Mr. Mashangu, who over the years ensured that this institution becomes indispensable. It is seen as a necessary tool to empower teachers, which empowerment reaches our learners. We believe in excellence in teaching. We believe in growth and expansion, and currently we are undergoing a very, very complex process which we were given by the former MEC, uh, MEC Panyaza Sufi, who said to us, you now must reposition yourselves. You now must turn yourselves into a higher education institution. That's not an easy task. We have started that work, uh, uh, Honorable Lusufi, we have made great strides in moving in that particular direction. We are at a point where we can confidently say it's just a matter of time before we go to the public and say, here is a repositioned institution with a particular focus on ECD. And we all know that uh, the migration of ECD from Department of Social Development to the Department of Education has placed a huge task on the Department of Education, and Matthew Goniwe School of Leadership and Governance will be leading in that particular space. So let me welcome all of you and hope that as we rise at the end of the lecture, we shall go back inspired by the attributes which Matthew Goniwe stood for and died for, and I'm sure had he lived, he would be making a very impactful contribution towards. After that, we are going to hear from the family of um, Goniwe. We will be hearing from um, Mr. Nyaniso Goniwe, who will be, Goniwe, who will be representing the family. Let's take a look. Today is a very important day for the school and for the community of Credoc, of course including the family of Matthew Goniwe and all other three families. The visit is always prepared for and welcomed warmly by the community of Credoc. The visit is done every year as one of the events leading up to the, the events leading up to the memorial lecture, which becomes the final uh, event for the year. We do this in memory of the contribution of Matthew Goniwe, who played a major role as a teacher, uh, building learners, and making a major contribution to the liberation of the people of South Africa.
today is uh, one of those special days for us as a department where we come to uh, remember uh, Matthew Koniwe and together with the crowd of four, but in particular Matthew Koniwe, because we have an institution that uh, helps us a lot, the Matthew Koniwe School of Leadership and Governance that we are using as a department of education to ensure that we instill particular values and other aspect within the sector. So we are pulling the values of Matthew Koniwe so that we can impart on our education department as a whole, in particular the educators uh, and the learners. So today uh, we had come to do a replaying, remembering uh, him uh, and obviously the, the comrades, uh, the Chronic Four comrades as well, uh, to say we still remember and we still abide by the values that they represented to us as a, as a people of uh, Gauteng, and I know the people of the Eastern Cape and this area as well, uh, they do recognize that. So that's why we're here and obviously engage with the community to say this is a person who was not only a son to your community, but he became a son and a father to all within our, 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 our country in particular. Today's event uh, evokes uh, bitter and sweet memories. Bitter in that uh, it's a food trail of the cruelty, the extent of repression that was uh, visited upon our people in the course of their struggle against uh, oppressing and for justice and human rights. It also underscores the partnership and relationship between the Konwe family as a family and the Matthew Konwe School of Leadership and the broader community of Credoc now called Inguba. Today's event brings back memories. Um, memories of, of the family, of the Credoc Four. We, we as a family, we keep Matthew's name alive by holding meetings in, in the community center. As a Nuba Yetemba municipality, the entire community, the family of Mr. Matthew Koniwe, we are really feeling honored by the visit of the Department of Education from Gauteng uh, to land in Credoc, where Mr. Koniwe was raised, born and raised, and he was leading at this space. And uh, it shows us he was amongst the leaders that are rare to breed. He's not just an ordinary leader because his impact, his footprint, it is felt in the entire country of South Africa. Footprint and his influence is felt across the country. With that said, I'm now going to call on a representative from the Koniwe family, Mr. Nyaniso Koniwe. Molueni, Sanbonani, Tumelan, good evening, Huyenant, eh? Africans, um, no, it's not too shabby. Uh, I'm here today representing the Koniwa family, most importantly, Matthew. My name is Unyani Sukoniwe, the son of Matthew Koniwe. However, I'm not here alone. I'm accompanied by some of the families, uh, namely my two sisters, Nobuzwe, Nobuikazi, right here, my cousin, Bungiwe Koniwe, my older cousin brothers, Patrick Koniwe, Mawonga Koniwe, Vuyo Koza, my niece and nephew, Andani Koniwe, Aliko Kasmeni, uh, and a friend to the family, Ubongo Animkond. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the Matthew Koniwa School of Leadership and Governance by hosting this prosperous occasion. I would also like to thank the CEO, Musiso Matangu, Chairman of the Board, Teliso Lidimo, 
and the whole board of directors at large, thank you. I'd also like to extend my gratitude to the MEC, Honorable Motama Chilwane, and the Premier, Honorable Panyaza Dosufi. The Konewa family, thanks you. Um, I would just like to touch on uh, a brief background on Matthew. Uh, Matthew Konewa was born on the 27th of December, 1947, in Lingalithi Township on the outskirts of Craddock in Eastern Cape. His parents, David and Elizabeth, were farm laborers. He was the youngest of the eight children. He attended St. James Primary School and afterwards attended St. Khan Secondary School, where he obtained his junior certificate. As a boy, he played rugby and took part in boxing for a club in the township. His love for music led him to join an early age to the Craddock Male Voices under the leadership of his brother, Uchakes. He matriculated at Hilltown, then studied to a teacher's diploma at the University of Fort Hare. His majors were mathematics and science. It was whilst studying at Fort Hare that Matthew became involved in student politics. He returned to St. Cloudy Secondary to teach mathematics and science, where he became a popular teacher. In 1972, he and another school teacher in Craddock, John Shekan, founded a school at Mkandul in the Transkai, which eventually became known as Olomista High School. 1975, he married Unyameg, Goni with my mom. <laughs> she later qualified to be a social worker in her own right. In 1983, the Craddock Youth Association, Kratoya, was launched with Matthew being elected as, as its first chairman and Fort Kalata as its secretary. One of the first tasks they embarked upon was to take a stand against the unfair rental system being proposed by the Eastern Cape uh, Administration Board. This precipitated the, for, the formation of the Civic Association in Lingalithia to deal with the crisis and Matthew was elected as the chairperson. In 1983, he called a mass meeting to discuss how the community should respond to the high rents, and the Craddock Res Residents Association, Cradora, was formed. Cradora applied sufficient pressure and won the fight as the rents were lowered. After the launch of the United Democratic Front, UDF, on the 20th of August, 1983, Cradora affiliated to the broad-based movement of organizations against apartheid. The security police, which, which removed his uh, influence from Craddock, pressured the Department of Education, the DET, on, the, on 1983 to transfer Matthew to school in Khafrenet as principal. Matthew refused the appointment. He applied to become an ordinary teacher at a school in Craddock, but he was turned down. The DET sent Matthew a telegram on the 29th of November, 1983, informing him of his transfer to Graf Renet from the 1st of January, 1984. Kadoya meeting attended by over 2,000 people from the community refused to accept the transfer. When Koniwa did not report for work in Khafu, the following year, the DET told him he had to be dismissed himself and he was officially fired on the 27th of January, 1984. This sparked a boycott on the 3rd of February, which spread throughout Craddock and then to the surrounding areas, lasting 15 months. The Cradora, Cradoya, UDF, and other organizations from PE and Utenek held meetings which supported the boycott. By 11th of March, 1984, 4,236 pupils had joined the boycott. Okay, this is the journey and some of the difficulties that Matthew had to go through to achieve what he would say, some would say, as impossible. Let's talk about that phrase, against the odds. Elon Musk once said, when something is important enough, you do, even, you do it even if the odds are against you. Although it is a nice thing to say, how practical is it? Matthew wouldn't have achieved what he achieved if he didn't fight against the odds. 
However, for some of us, our goals and ambitions often seem out of reach, and it is hard to imagine that someone like Matthew felt the same way as we do. He was once someone with dreams. We also had doubters and his own challenges to face. We will face many challenges and doubters that throw us off our paths. In many cases, they will succeed for a short while. In some cases, they can succeed for years. Our doubters and our doubts will divert our path. It is unrealistic to believe that we can just ignore the doubts because we are only human. We do not like failing and we will always have fears in our lives. What matters is how we continue with our path whilst we doubt and fear. So I thank everybody here today for attending this event. And in doing so, we honor Matthew's legacy, a legacy of fighting against all the odds and knowing we can also do the same. In this time of uncertainty, we've been through the coronavirus, the economies are struggling, people lost their jobs, we are on the doorstep of the next, what, world war. So I implore you, now is the time for the world to come together and like Matthew, fight against all the odds. Thank you. Um, incredible also to listen to that story being told uh, from a first-hand experience. Uh, Mr. Nyani Sokoniwe, thank you so much for sharing that story with us, and thank you so much for being brave. And I guess all of us this evening will be heeding the call as well. Um, how do we change our societies? Um, as we said earlier on, that is, is the 10th Matthew Koniwe Memorial Lecture. So we are going to look back at some of the previous lectures that have been had as we build up to the keynote address that will be delivered by the premier of the province, Banyazali Sufi. We are now going to back, go back to the memorial lecture that was delivered at the SABC, by the way, where I work, in 2018. And let's look back and reflect on that. As an organization, we are proud and honored to be named after him. We hold that name with the highest of esteem, and you'll all get to hear why we do so from the various speakers that we have today. Who was Matthew Konewe? And what did he represent? Long before the oppressive regime brutally killed him, he had a vision of a new South Africa. A South Africa where everybody will be free, a South Africa where human rights will be upheld. As an institute working closely with the Houghton Department of Education, it's going to become an opportune moment for us to then say, are we delivering what we have set ourselves to deliver? We are very grateful to, have been wit to be witnesses uh, to the good work, legacy work that you're doing at uh, MEC. And we look forward to, to, to a successful partnership with, with you in your quest to make sure that our history does not disappear. That's coming new South Africa of Matthew has arrived. But now, what do we do about these ideas? We want to declare, as we have declared in 1985, to say, Matthew Goniwe, there's no grave big enough to carry you the giant of our revolution. That those that thought it will be the end when they assassinated you, they must rethink. And those that thought it was the end, they must know it was the beginning that those that took your life and the life of your comrades must know that they will never take your memory away from us. 
Kwaniwa is a generation of anti-apartheid activists that pay the ultimate price for our freedom that we enjoy today. He delivered education for liberation. And this explains why he was a brilliant teacher, because he understood that learners come from a community, hence he was always a community leader. <laughs> But not now. Now I'm going to call on positive vibrations, and after positive vibrations, we're going to hear from the MEC of Education in Gauteng, Honorable Matume Chirwan. gentlemen and I welcome you here tonight and I say to you for all the protocols observed now I'm calling upon these young girls because the theme tonight is transformative leadership for social change it's about empowering the next generation and here we are seeing them, right? This is positive vibrations. The art of, this is their byline, right? The art foundation of hope for girls. Now, they have empowered me because of the things that they do for themselves. They are part of the leadership that young girls such as themselves attend to do public speaking, to gain confidence, and to recognize themselves as human beings, not just items that are seen by other people, right? We have a social standard that is being illified by our contribution, where young girls are missing, young girls are being abducted, raped, and so it's up to us to do something so we can liberate. I want to have you welcome them back on stage because such talent should be appreciated beyond what we see. And then, just again, we're going to give one of them an opportunity to speak because there is a request posted. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Zianda Manana from Positive Vibrations Arts Foundation of Hope for the Girls. And as Positive Vibrations, we will be embarking on a leadership summer camp to Durban this December. But because since we are a self-funded organization, we are mostly um, funded, we mostly fund ourselves or ask money from our parents, which many of them do not work. We would like to request each and every one of you here to donate anything that you can because um, we have transport, um, <laughs> we, <laughs> we don't have um, money to, to pay for our transport, we have to buy toiletries and all that. Anything will be appreciated by positive vibrations. God bless you and thank you in advance. <laughs>
it is known that Africa only had black people, Asia had yellow people, and Europe had white people. Now, it is very absurd to have to say that we Africans were not there when the white men had came. Secondly, the conqueror writes our history. They came, they conquered, and they wrote. Now, how do you expect people who came to invade us to write the truth about us? They will always write negative things about us. They have to do that because they have to justify their invasion. We do not write our history. It has been handed over to us orally by our elders. In fact, you do not know anything about any place until a white man gets there. Until a white man comes to you and says, Boof, I have discovered you and now you may live, which is ridiculous. Those who know must write. It's amazing to witness such talent, especially during such an occasion whereby a man that died, this is what he sacrificed for. The young minds that continue to show us what we are capable of. Sometimes we make it so much about color because we've been through so much, but because we're celebrating a man that stood for what you see me carrying today, right? A book, because it's knowledge. And when you write your thoughts and you share, you become that book that's celebrated. So may we continue to celebrate not only ourselves, but each other. He came up as an activist in Kosasa in Tembisa Ekuruleni. He was later elected ANC Youth League Chairperson in Gauteng in 2014. His youth activism saw him elected to the Gauteng Provincial Legislature where he was appointed to serve as the Chairperson of Education Portfolio Committee. He was later appointed to serve as the MEC of Education by the man that's sitting right next to him. Talk about passing the bat, right? Rele Sufi. This is in 2022. His appointment has been very warmly welcomed, and I think we see why. This is a celebration, because teachers welcomed him. They knew his agenda and what he was going to transform with the education system. Ladies and gentlemen, may we welcome the MEC of Education, Mr. Mato Mechilwan. Thank you. Level. Before I start, um, Premier, I saw that video. Hey, you look very handsome then. <laughs> Don't you think? It was in 2014, I'm sure, that <laughs> It was in 2014, I can assume. Uh, now we are a whole different uh, uh, premier. Uh, thank you so much. Um, let's give uh, our children here uh, another round of applause. Uh, you know, we are talking with uh, uh, Goniwe, Mr. Goniwe there. Eh? How do they remember all of that? Eh? All of that for about 15 minutes, all of it. Eh, that's incredible. Yeah, no, I babu tal baba pala was to know. Eh, Dumalang, San Bonani, good evening. Tobela Molueni. Uh, program director, once more, greetings to you. Now that program director, we are calling you to our programs. We expect you to be nice. 
Anke re o patela no. We expect you to be nice. So be nice. Our premier of Gauteng, Mr. Banyaza Sufi, the first MEC of Education, Professor Mary Metcalf. Uh, you know, I'm thinking when I'm looking at you both, and I'm thinking, which part should it be my future here? <laughs> Academics or football? <laughs> I must just choose between. Because clearly, either or uh, should be. Uh, so, Prof, thank you very much. Chairperson of uh, Chairperson and Board of Directors of Mercy Goniwe. Uh, Chairperson and Board of Directors of Saibono, they are present here. The CEO of uh, Mercy Goniwe and the CEO of Saibono. Senior leadership of the department present here led by the HOD, uh, the HOD is young, seven days old, so he's on probation. <laughs> uh, he used to tell me that, uh, Premier, that uh, for the first 12 months, my salary is on the 30th. I'm on probation, so I've completed my 12 months. So it's him now. And that uh, Rufus Mutlana, the Goniwa family, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again. Good evening. As we gather here to commemorate this timeless, uh, timeless legacy, it's exactly 90 days from what would have been Matthew Goniwa's uh, 76th, 76th birthday. We encounter a rare opportunity to reflect on the journey we have traversed and the journey that still lies ahead. The year 2023 has marked three significant milestones that are of particular relevance to the memory, life, and times of Mercy Goniwe. Firstly, 2023 marks, this, marks the 75th anniversary of a post-World War II economic order, the legacy of which has not been kind to the development prospects of the African continent and their people. Despite the visible progress, we have made as a continent, we remain far from an Africa that is collectively prosperous and at peace with itself. Secondly, this year also marked the 60th anniversary of the Organization of African Unity and an essential reminder to all Africans, those at home and in the diaspora, that Africa's path to complete economic independence and self-determination is far from complete. This memorial lecture, therefore, marks a significant milestone in, a, in our journey to rewrite our developmental script and imagine a more just and humane future for all Africans. Mithi Koniwe would have been only 16 years old in 1963 when President Kwame Nkrumah made the following statement at the founding of the OAU. He said, Africa must unite or perish. The struggle against colonialism does not end with the attainment of national independence. We are fast learning that political independence is not enough to rid us of consequences of colonial rule. We must unite to achieve full liberation. We have already reached the stage where we must unite and sink into the, sink into the condition which has made Latin America and the unwilling and distressed prey of imperialism. The mere point of unity amongst Africans places us in the arena of world power and great potential for the future we want. From this position of power, in an increasingly contested geopolitical era, our freedom can be preserved without sacrificing our way of life. Therefore, the memory of Messi Goniwe, along with his legacy in education, represents a canvas from which we can anticipate a tomorrow that is radically different from yesterday. To achieve this, we need a curriculum that does not act as a rationale for plundering, for plundering our resources. We need a curriculum that acts as an undercurrent of a sovereign people. In honor of Mithi Koniwe, our education system should begin to challenge the paradox of a wealthy Africa 
that is inhabited by impoverished Africans. Our education system must be measured against this test. Globally, as things stand, everyone else except us is commanding the levers of global economic power in the service of their current and future well-being, mostly at the expense of the African continent. Thirdly, our memorial lecture is taking place a few months before the democratic dispensation for which Matthew Goniwe paid the highest price, 1030. Let us take this opportunity to reflect <clears throat> on whether we have done justice to the memory of Matthew Goniwe. The extent to which the apartheid legacy lives on is reflected clearly on how race, class, space, and gender come together to reproduce unequal patterns of educational attainment. These disparities in turn mirror unemployment rates, the, the widening levels of income, wealth, and spatial disparities. Locally, our education system must be measured against this test. Lastly, as we commemorate Matthew Goniwe, significant parts of our history and liberation heritage remain silenced, undocumented, and absent from our nation's imagination. Our veterans' life stories remain largely absent from the curriculum at all levels of education and public discourse. Subsequently, our nation is losing its liberation, cultural, and intellectual heritage faster than it is being preserved. We have not done justice to the names like Matthew Koniwe, despite their immeasurable service to this nation and liberation project. The name of Matthew Koniwe is nowhere in our school books. Thus, when it comes to honoring and embodying the memory of our founding fathers beyond Matthew Koniwe, the curriculum taught to our children is far from ideal. That's why we're still waiting for history to be compulsory. I'm, I'm told that it started in 2009. How many years uh, we've been doing that research to making, making history compulsory? It's over a decade, and still nothing has come. So stories that, that desperately need to be told remain untold. They are songs, photos, diaries, their thoughts, hopes, dreams, aspirations need to be communicated through books for children, youth, and adults. Mentaries, short films, and portraits. In the era where our children are constantly and often opportunistically told to forget the past and be forward looking. Let us remind our children that nothing could be more detrimental than disregarding our history and culture. Therefore, Professor Clark reminds us that to control a people, you must first control what they think about themselves and how they regard their history and culture. And when you conquer, when you conquer makes you, when your conqueror makes you ashamed of your culture and your history, he needs no prison walls and no change. The job is already done. And furthermore, in the words of uh, Maria Makeba, she says, the conqueror, conqueror writes history. They came, they conquered, and they wrote. Uh, as uh, our daughter also alluded, you don't expect people who came to invade us to tell the truth about us. They will always write negative things, and they have to do that because they have to justify as if justify what? The invasion. <laughs> so Makeba's words are further supported by historian Robin Walker, who advances an argument, and I wish to repeat it here today, when he says, those who conquer, colonize, and enslave you have to make your history disappear in order to make it seem like they conquered, colonized, and enslaved nobodies. When you have a history, you become somebody. So if you remove the history, you become nobody. There are psychological reasons why people would like to associate themselves with a history. There is a link between what someone thinks of themselves and what someone thinks of their people, and what they think of their people and their history. 
So the erasure of our past has sought to reduce Africans to nobodies and to make us think less of ourselves. In reality, Africans have fought longer and harder against great, great odds for a more just and humane society. As I conclude, Robin Walker, Maria Makeba, and others correctly placed emphasis on the fact that when you surrender knowledge production and, and decimation, decimation to the elites, you surrender your future in its entirety. We should therefore support emerging writers, researchers, and publishers who, who document and write about our heritage in ways that reinforce our educational project. Let this memorial lecture infuse the much needed inspiration for all of us to serve the developmental agenda for which Matthew Goniwe and many others paid the highest price. Thank you. Well, so you heard the MEC saying that uh, they are paying me. <laughs> uh, I, I can publicly declare that I cannot accede to the request of being nice. <laughs> but um, MEC, um, Zianda made a call earlier on. They are going to a leadership um, excursion. Don't forget that, MEC. They requested money. Since well, the MEC pays people, you know? <laughs> Since it's the MEC of payment. <laughs> MEC, can I say with the money that you will be paying me, I'll, I'll donate 2,000. <laughs> so, um, so ladies, already there's 2,000. I'm sure the MEC can do 10 times more than I can. <laughs> Um, so, as we said earlier on, that we continue to reflect on the previous lectures that we've had here. We are now going to look at a lecture from 2019, and after that, we are going to, um, we're going to hear from one of the performances that we'll be having a bit later on, which is from the Lisedi Cultural Group, as we build up to our guest speaker, Professor Mary Metcalf. Visionaries, great revolutionaries who exercise the task of teaching an African child with diligence, with dedication and passion. We must always be reminded that before we got here, there are those who paid the final price to get us here. And Matthew Gonio was in the center of those who have had to pay the final price, have been brutally assassinated by the apartheid regime, he had to pay the final price for ensuring that the African people are liberated in our country. I'm honored to speak about somebody who made it possible for us to celebrate whatever we have in our country. With a heavy task and a heavy mandate, to speak about Matthew Goniwe and those that know him, they will say he died, but I'm here in front of the family to say Matthew Goniwe is not dead. How can Matthew Goniwe die when those that were influenced by him are continuing with the struggle that he fought for? Matthew said, in the world, afflicted by suffering, it is incumbent upon all those who regard themselves as human beings to be agents of change in their societies. Amampene, O Chambas, 
Ivulukango, Ivulukango, in the Goba, Bangene, Otoku, Amakwai, Ivule Lukango, Amakoma, Ivule Lukango, O Pele, O Campo, Nazozogi, Swele, and Sodeleo, Apaglom Sola, Ipagamise, Umama Wetu, Umamukoniwe, Anigumialezo, Ekamin, the Femen. He would not have achieved what he achieved if you were not in Bogoto by his side. Zagbulela nawe kakhulu. Balilizelo mama babetha mafleto. Many people would be quick to ask and wonder why is Matthew Gonewe being honored and celebrated in Gauteng and not in the Eastern Cape? My quick answer to that question is, why not? He was one of our own, but also belonged to the world. To all the teachers who are here, we want to say there is a Matthew Goniwe in all of you and all of us. So we want to say to the board and all the people who are involved, in uh, making the school, the Matthew Gonway School, what it is today to continue. And we all say, Pambil, you are on the right path. You have all our support. Matthew Gonway will not be forgotten. Matthew Gonway is going to be with us, not only today, nor tomorrow, but forever. Maybe to summarize it, Matthew Gonway is us. We are Matthew Gonway. Without Mothi Goniwe, we are empty. I think it was Mariah Carey who sang that if you look inside your heart, you don't have to be, be afraid. There's a hero inside of you. And as you heard, we all have a Matthew Goniwe inside of us. So how do you breathe life into it? How do you breathe life into the Matthew Gonyue that he is inside of you? Let's welcome the Lisedi Cultural Group, and after that, our guest speaker, Mary Metcalf.
You don't speak of who you are, you display it. So as much as I wanted to intro, I wanted you to see me. So <laughs> I read something disturbing, but then I thought, let me share because it will be a thought. Targeted to be removed permanently from society as a matter of urgency. That's what they spoke of Mr. Matthew Koniwe. So now the thought is, what is your legacy? What is it that you're doing to build up and showcase your capabilities, not only for self, because we understand you can do, that you are capable. But for people around you, are you adding value? Are you adding value? Education is about sharing information for others to liberate themselves. I think there is joy when we all grow together, right? So I don't know if this applies, but it seems like the shorter it is, maybe the person has done a lot of work. The longer the introduction, there's still a lot more work to be done. So let's speak of Mary Metcalf, former MEC of Education in Gauteng, educator and an academic, currently serving as a director on multiple boards of NPOs and has over the years served in leadership of over 20 boards and governance structures. May we kindly help welcome Ms. Mary Metcalf. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to use this one. Thank you very much. I'm not sure about 20 boards. Eh? <laughs> But thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Matthew Kaniwe School of Leadership for inviting me to come tonight and to let me go like this, give a lecture. When I was invited, I was really honored to be invited and there was no ways I could say no. So I accepted um, straight away and I want to thank you for that. But I have to tell you that I've really struggled to prepare this lecture. And let me say it's not going to be a lecture. And the reason that I've struggled is because this is a story that moves me so greatly. I cannot be academic about it. I'm not going to give you an academic analysis. And probably for the first time, I'm not even going to talk about education. But before I start talking, I want to say how honored I am to be here with the Ganiwe family. It's very moving to me. I want to acknowledge Nabuzwe. It's wonderful to meet you. And uh, I think, Yaniswa, we've already spoken. I'm going to get his phone number. Wonderful person to keep in touch with. The relatives, the cousins, all of you. It means a lot to me to have, have met you. And I want to acknowledge the loss of your mother hmm? during COVID. We saw her 
on the videos, and I'm sure that must have been so. But we do need to acknowledge that. Now, the reason why I've struggled to prepare is because for me, I cannot separate what I think from what I feel in relation to the Craddock Hall. And when I try to prepare and try to think, you know, they're expecting a lecture, let me think. It was what I felt that kept surfacing. So I am going to talk about how I feel more than what I think. I think that I'm going to tell it like a story, and it's a story that you all know so well. I haven't been to all of the Matthew Ganewe School of Leadership's annual lectures, and you guys have probably heard the story again and again and again. So in me telling the story, it's because this is what matters to me. Now, I did prepare some slides, but these are not slides that are full of text. Ooh, this is the, definitely the wrong presentation. So if you go into the memory stick, it would say 231208 Metcalf Matthew Ganewe School of Leadership. Otherwise, you have to sit through my presentation to Satu Free State. You don't want to do that. It's interesting, but it's, it's not what you want. So what I'm going to talk about today is what the Craddock Four mean to all of us. Um, I'm going to talk about the questions I ask myself as a consequence of the lives of the Craddock Four. And I can probably talk without slides, but I think it would be a pity. Oh, you know what? I think you guys gave me back the memory stick. I don't know what that is. Uh, Aldrin? <clears throat> You know what? I think I'm just going to yeah, grab my bag because I think. Lalise, what? Do you need the memory stick again? Yeah. No, the black. Okay. Hey, Eldrin, I never thought I'd get you working for me. <laughs> and for free as that. And for free. <laughs> yeah. So there it is. It's on the. Thanks, Laliswa. Thank you. Double. <laughs> so, uh, and I must just apologize for the lack of balance. That's just an old age issue. Okay, so while they look at the slides, I'm going to start telling the story. So for me, and we'll go through the slides very quickly once they've, they've opened the right presentation, is... This is the Matthew Ganewe lecture. Last year, advocate uh, Nguka Tobi gave an amazing address. I, I can see people who were here last year saying it was fantastic. He is a fantastic South African, wonderful young South African. And as you'll see just now when the slides come, what he was challenging us to do is to not forget how Matthew died, to not forget why he died, and to understand more deeply what it means to us. That's what I understood from last year's lecture, from what I could glean in the reports that I could find. But I see people like the Premier and others saying, yeah, I remember, he was amazing, which he would have been. So what I wanted to do tonight was to build on that to ask the questions about who, why, what, and what does it mean for us today. 
I need to explain now why this historic event has moved me so much. And for those of you who haven't read it, try and get Lucania Colata's book, My Father Did Not Die for This. Because it tells the story of Matthew, it tells the story of Fort, it tells the story of the community, and it looks at the pain of the tragedy, the pain of the loss on the families. So if I do get the slides, otherwise it will be a very short talk. What I'm trying to do is to say, let's look beyond this grand mythology, the grand edifice of the name, and remember who these people really were, what they did. Let's get away from form and get back to content. And to quote your words, to think about how do we add value. So, the next slide which you can't see has, <laughs> has got a picture of the often used pictures of the Craddock Four, which I think many of you will know are not the Craddock Four. That there's often an image used in which there's two wonderful activists, Matthew's cousin and Jacob's, aha, uh -huh, there we go. Next slide, I'm just gonna go next slide, next slide till we catch up. Thank you for finding it. So, that, if you click, that's what he said. We've got to keep alive. We've got to, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad the slide is there because it isn't just remember Matthew. It is reminding us of how we should look after each other while we're still alive. And I found that incredible. So the next click is the My Father Died for This by Lucania Colata and his wife Abigail. Next click. So what I want to argue is in remembering, we've also got to recommit. What is it that we're committing to? And we've got to remember the Craddock Four, if you move on, in terms of transformative leadership. I almost felt I was gonna ask you a quiz. Who knows what Craddock is? Hmm? Far away, you know, you guys went down there in a combi, I think, or in a, but there we are. Now, these, Mbulele Konewe was not killed as part of the Craddock Four, nor was Madoro Jacobs, both of them, but Fort and Matthew were critical leaders in the history of Craddock. And I want to talk now about Setrelo Mshloli in the next slide. No, go back one. Thank you. No, back one. There we are. So, you know, Setrelo Mshloli was an old school friend. I feel silly telling this to the family. You know this. An old school friend of Matthew. He happened to be visiting Craddock in the school holidays while his wife was at a course in Port Elizabeth. He connected with Matthew and Matthew said, hey, we're going to Port Elizabeth, come with us. You can see your wife, we'll go there, we'll come back. But Satello, whose name is often forgotten in telling the story, He's also a teacher, also an activist, a principal. He was involved in the Oatsorn Youth Organization. He was part of structures that joined the UDF. He survived an arson attack. But sometimes when you read the story, people say it was an accident that he was also one of the Craddock Four because he wasn't meant to be there. And we must remember that he was married, Nomboyesello, that there's children, 
Nsika, Babalwa. Can we find them in the web? Can we find their stories, who they are? Let's talk about Sparrow Mkonto. So Sparrow Mkonto left school, standard eight, went to work in the railways, became a unionist, became a leader in the unions. He was a senior office bearer in Cradora. He also attracted the attention of the security police. The security police harassed that family. They managed to get him fired. They managed to get the wife fired from her job. We cannot forget these stories. Now let's come to Fort Kalata. Now Fort was the youngest of the four who was killed. He was only 28. Can you think when you were 28, hmm? Aldrin, it was recent, ne? Yeah? 28 is young. He was the youngest of the four. Because I've read that book and love it so much, I'm familiar with these names, with these pictures, with the family. But there were children, Dorothy, Lucania, Tumani. Tumani was born, I think, six weeks after he died. There you go. So we acknowledge you, and I'm sorry I didn't meet you earlier. But you'll see pictures of yourself. So, I'm so happy you're here, and I'm going to give you a hug afterwards. All right. So, Fort was also a teacher, also a principal. They taught together, they worked for the community together. He was a founding member of Craddock Residence Association, that became the president of the Craddock Youth Organization. His wife, Nyameka, social worker. No, I'm this, yeah. His wife, Matthew, oh, I'm looking at the wrong thing. His wife, Namande, um, was also harassed terribly before his death and after his death. Now, if we move to the next slide, what I want to tell you, which you may know but you may not know, is I'm trying to show the depth of the political conviction and discipline of these families that we are honoring tonight, much more than even Matthew. So, Fort Kalata's grandfather, your grand, great-grandfather, he was the Secretary General of the ANC from 36 to 49. He played that incredible role at a very important time. He was a choir master. He raised money for the ANC with this wonderful choir going around. What's more, on the next slide, he was one of the treason trialists. So what we have is this icon, this massive man in our history, Matthew Ganiwe, but embedded in a community of people with depth, with commitment, who together contributed so much and who together provided leadership, were harassed, and this was not just a quick killing. It was the culmination of real pain. It was the culmination of people making massive sacrifices over many years. So there's James Kalata, and the next slide, some pictures of your dad, of Fort. Just after initiation, you'll recognize these pictures because you know them in the book. Young man, a young man in a band. Next slide, where are we now? Yeah, yeah, the wedding photo. I always find it a bit puzzling because some photos on the web have a different photo in a white dress. But your brother's book has this as the wedding picture. 
What I can tell, and in a way I would love you to stand up and tell the story, such a loving, loving, loving marriage. A man who was a political leader, a teacher, but also so utterly committed to his family. If we move on to the next slide. There we go, the, the eldest one. Fought the family together. The family man all of the time. So, what I want us to note is these were remarkable men. They were remarkable men who spent all their working life working for the community, daily, weekly, being a teacher, being a principal, being a community leader with such dedication and remarkable woman. Can we not forget that? Eh? The remarkable woman. And of course, here there's two photos that I've got to tell to tell the story. Mumonde and Nyameka. Mumonde, I think, at the TRC and Nyameka in 1988. Now, I've got so much to say about Matthew. Next slide. But firstly, I'm scared of Aldrin. And secondly, people have spoken about Matthew. You know that story so well. But there are some things that I want to say about Matthew that I wasn't aware of. Did you know that his brother Jacques was killed by the Rhodesian security forces in the Wanki Sipolelo battles. When Matthew was 21, his older brother died in that war in 1968. So let's unravel some of the suffering and courage, commitment, and discipline. When we talk, stay on this slide for a bit now. When we talk about Matthew as a teacher, and I'm sure the stories I've read about Matthew are probably true of others as well. But Matthew's passion for his children meant that he didn't just greet them at the gate, tell them to go to class. He visited in the family, understood the levels of poverty, raised money, for children to eat. His work as an educator never was compromised for the political work. He was absolutely committed to both because he loved. He loved our people. He loved the children. And he knew that education was critical for them to progress. He, not long before he was killed, was busy negotiating a return to school. Him and Ford together are famous for their discipline and working to make sure. He is a giant of a man. If we go to the next slide. He became the leader of Credora he became the rural organizer for the UDF. He was under surveillance by the security police because they suspected what we later knew is that in fact, in addition to the remarkable levels of organization that he created in Craddock, it was like a model level of organization for any township in the country. They called it the G plan. Remember the M plan? Uh-huh, Mandela plan. This was the G plan. So Matthew organized in a disciplined way while he taught, while he cared for his children, while he cared for his family. And what we subsequently learned he was also the chairman of the ANC's Underground Military Working Committee. And as he established structures, this lion of a man, as he was able to put more and more structures in place, he was eventually reporting directly to Chris Hani. Now, why is this important? It's important because 
this man was a problem. Hmm? And what I find interesting in reading the history is that even within the apartheid establishment, there were not agreements. The DET recognized that they needed him and they thought he could control him, but not the military. And so, where we land up is my next slide, what I call Blue Water Bay. Now, this come, everything I've spoken about so far ins inspires and we should be emulating. This is the point at which, when I say I have difficulty preparing, this is why. Blue Water Bay, I'm not gonna go into all of the details, but you know people, the four were coming back from the meeting, UDF meeting in Port Elizabeth. They didn't get home. They were found dead. If you move to the next slide, the car was burnt. The bodies were some distance from each other, and I cannot talk about it because it's too painful. But bodies were mutilated. Ne? If you move on, I've touched on it in terms of um, Zepelo and Sparrow. I read that Sparrow, even though he, once they were in the car and being abducted, even though he's, he was handcuffed, he managed to do something which I couldn't understand, to try and strangle the driver. He put up a fight, but the bodies were mutilated, the bodies were burnt. And what that led to is we've, we lost Fort Collat. We lost Matthew Ganeri. Now, I'm going to hurry up a bit. I'm going to not talk about Matthew, go to the funeral, just show you images to understand the impact of these incredible human beings, incredible human beings on the community. So let's just quickly go through these pictures. You've seen them all. Some of them are from your brother's book. Some of them are from the web. But if we go on, this we saw you visiting. We saw you visiting this memorial. Click on. Click on. We come to 1994. And this is where I want to stop talking about how we need to honor Matthew Fort Sapello Sparrow. And I want to say it's 1994. Now the challenge must come to us. Because we have a constitution which those wonderful children sang so beautifully. And that constitution for me is a bridge. It's a bridge between these amazing men. Now go back. Oh no, here it is, sorry. It's just, sorry, no, the, yeah, go back. Sometimes it's, diff oh, I've got it here, sorry. I'll look there. <laughs> sorry, darlings. If you just, yeah. So what I want to say is the Constitution is so, back. <laughs> the Constitution is so important to me because if you take everything we know about Matthew, about Fort, about the others, I think it's encapsulated in what the children were saying. So they had given their life for this constitu Constitution. If if they had been there to sing with the children, we adopt the, this constitution, what they would be saying is, this is what I struggled for. This is what all of the effort was for. Now, the next part here is exactly what the children said. This is the preamble to the constitution. The children sang it to us, you familiar. I love this. But if we move on, and I'm hurrying because I'm watching children, is that all of these activists, and we talk about activists in Limpopo, Eastern Cape, KZN, all over the country, they all provided the leadership that gave us this const... <laughs> this const... <laughs> they all provided... No, go back. <laughs> yeah. But you... Yeah, stay there, stay there, please. 
why that's important for me is they brought us there, but it's our job to take it forward. That's the lesson. If I stop there, if you shouted at me, Alden, I could stop there, but I don't want to. Because they gave us that constitution, it's our job to take it forward. So click into the next slide, and I'm not going to read that slide, you've already seen it. These are all of the rights in the constitution, the children did it beautifully. I would love to say to the families, would, this, would they be proud of this? Are these the rights? that they pushed for. And I think you're going to tell me yes. But now let's move on. Because from here, we have got responsibilities to improve the quality of life. It's not enough to just say Matthew was wonderful, let's celebrate him. Move on. Next slide. And now I'm going to talk about um, Fort's book. Is, there's a monument, and I think you guys might have visited it. So, the monument looks glorious. And I found a lovely line from a poem about a monument being uh, a bridge between earth and what earth cannot touch. So we've got these wonderful, concrete, lovely pillars. But what happened when Lucania went there? Let's look. I think it's here. Click. No, no. Before we go there, 1994 Constitution, and now we have this wonderful monument. But stay on that slide. The problem with moving from vision and ideals into a future that we've imagined and fought for is that we still live with a legacy of the realities of the pains of the past. Life doesn't change because we've got a Constitution. There are real material differences and challenges in our life. There are real material damages to our thinking, in our behaviors, and our imagination. So in moving from the Constitution into this new world, the past is with us. The imperfections are with us. Inequality is with us. Sexism is with us. Racism are with us. And there's new challenges for us, wherever we are, in whatever leadership role. These new corrosive influences, materialism, what we drive, what we wear, notions of leadership in terms of a hierarchy of leadership, and because I'm in authority, I'm an authority, I'm not a servant leader. Power and status, all of that becomes seductive. And we forget that this new world that we're creating is built on the characters and principles and values of men who did not have that power that is material, that is positional, and in which they kept close to the people, in touch with the families. So let's carry on. I do get even more upset, you'll see. So. Next slide. I don't know, maybe she likes that one. <laughs> because where I want to go from here is to the TRC. You know, the TRC was meant to be something that was not retributive, but restorative. But I want to say today, and I am in the presence of people who know better, the TRC process failed the families. Can I say so? The TRC, thank you. If you click onto the next slide, I think, maybe, yeah, is that there was not a full confession. There was a Sweetie pie, kind of, I'm terribly sorry, I watched an American movie, I now understand racism. So the widows opposed amnesty, and they were not given amnesty. But the betrayal became deep, because evidence came about the extent to which the security forces were complicit 
the extent to which there were clear instructions, the extent to which there was vicious, not just, this isn't an assassination. It was causing real pain and suffering. And so, I don't know where that comes from, but if you move on to, oh yeah. The, sorry, these slides aren't working, but they work for me. Now let's just pause there. That's a picture of Hussi Pakoli. He's smiling. He's not smiling because he's pleased about anything. But on a video, he is saying, we were proceeding with prosecution of these murderers, and we were given a political instruction to not proceed. That's not a secret. If you do your research, it's there. And I say, that's a betrayal. It's a betrayal of the families when the restorative process that we put into place is subverted because of power. And I'm sorry, in a way, to be speaking like this in front of the family. So Vosi on camera is saying, I was instructed to not proceed. That is not okay. In moving from the past to the future, we have not been true to the ideals and the courage of the Craddock Four. So, your brother Lukanya, he, he spends his life saying, we want justice. I saw an amazing video of your mother saying, if only I had known if only I had known how they died, I might have had a different life. I might have been a different person. We let them down. Let's move on, and I'm going to hurry. So there is a picture of Lukanya now. That's Lukanya. Next, no, next slide, because I'm hurrying. That's Lukanya walking to the monument. Now, for me, what he sees at that monument is absolutely symbolic of the challenges in our, our reality of moving from the past into an idealized future. It's the first time he says he's been to the monument. He hadn't been. He was there with an Al Jazeera crew. When he got there, what did he see? Next slide now. Who is Ugoni? So the monuments we create are decaying in front of our eyes and we cannot look after them. So he, Lucania is distraught in this video. He actually goes away and you think he's gonna have a cry. Let's move on to the next slide, because this phobia, he tries to say, but here's my father's name. Why can't it be on the monument? But move on. So I think, does it matter? Does it matter that Matthew's initials have fallen off the monument, that Fort's name has fallen off, or is it a symbol of a greater neglect? Hmm? Is it a symbol of a greater neglect? Is it a neglect of their vision? Is it a neglect of their ethic? Is it a neglect of everything that they sacrificed for? Because you see, the concrete and the metal doesn't create immortality. It's just concrete and metal. Go back, please. It's the actions that we take that make the meaning of Matthew's life, the meaning of Fort's life, the meaning of Satkelo's life, and the meaning of so many people's life have meaning. It's in our actions, not in concrete and metal, not in paper. So I'm going to move very quickly now, hey, Adrian, because I think I'm very late. Go past, that's just pictures of you and your family going to the funeral, and then go through all of these. So I had to, in thinking about this lecture, get past my anger, which you can see is real. I can't hide it. I'm angry. I get emotional about this stuff. It just, for people to have died in that vicious way, and for there not to be justice, and not justice for the family, so I myself have to move away from my anger. And this is how I move away from my anger. We have to honor deliberatively, thoughtfully, and 
deliberately. I have to recommit to continue to make a difference, which is why I like what you said about add, add value. It's not enough to come to the lecture to have can I pay to see wonderful friends. What are we going to do that takes forward the substance of their life? And so these are the questions I ask myself, and you can go all the way back to the bottom. What were the instruments that Matthew and Fort had? Principle, courage, love and concern for people, and real commitment. Now, if we go to the click. Okay, stop there. What are the instruments we have? MEC, Premier. If Matthew had the instruments you had, can you imagine the power he would have to change lives? And I'm not picking on my beloved MEC and, and Premier. Each one of us, wherever we are, in government, out of government, in our church, in our community, in our school governing bodies, we have more power that comes from law, that comes from the gift of history. But if we don't match it with principle, with resisting the trappings of power, with courage, with real love and concern, with the rejection of materialism, we're not going to have the impact that they had with so much less. I think that's really the last point. Let's see if there's another one, but I think that's it. Okay, so we've got to honor their memory. We've got to honor the memory and how we make the Constitution real in the lives of our people. Thank you, Aldrin. <laughs> what an incredible storyteller, yeah? And also using um, the element of visuals that really bring the story back home and uh, being touched by the research um, that uh, Professor Mary Cal Metcalf has made and uh, Prof speaks about um, the betrayal. Um, the betrayal that the NPA didn't see through the prosecution of uh, the suspects who are or were accused of the murder of the Cradock Four. She also speaks about what Vusi Pikoli said, the former NDPP. And if you look at the Supreme Court of Appeal case, it is in that court judgment as well where it reflects on what the NPA said they were told by then the Mbeki administration, not to go ahead with the prosecutions. And sadly, earlier on this year, the last suspect, Hermanus Duplessis, died. And you can only imagine the devastation that that would have caused the family because they've been pushing and pushing for a prosecution. The NPA said that they were then committed to go ahead with the prosecution. But later on, early this year, in June, they were told, unfortunately, it's not going to happen because there's no one left to prosecute. But, like the Premier said, in the clip that was played earlier on, when he spoke about the life of Matthew Cornewin. Even though they were murdered in 1985, their spirit continued to live on. Even though Matthew Cornewin was murdered in 1985, there is now a Matthew Cornewin School of Leadership and Governance. So the name lives on, and so does the legacy. And once again, thank you so much to the family for the contribution that they have given to us by supporting him in his endeavors to making this country a much better world. We're now going to play another reflection on the past lecture that happened in 2021 at Redison Blue. And then after that, we're going to have a performance as we build up to the address by the Premier of the province, Banyaza Lisufi.
It is said that teaching is the one profession that creates all other professions. I do wonder what Matthew Gonu would do in 2021. We would continue to perpetuate and to live the legacy that Matthew Gonu left for all of us. That's a big question I want us to take home, all of us. Had Matthew Gonuwe lived, what would be his view about the current dispensation in education? I noticed that the motto of the Matthew Gonuwe School of Leadership and Governance is educate, empower, and innovate. But I found the words educate, empower, and innovate very powerful. The world we are living in is a constantly changing world and is constantly being disrupted. Right now, uh, the disruption is called the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth industrial revolution is very transformative. It's like getting into a wormhole where we really do not know what the outcome is going to look like. The fourth industrial revolution produces three things, new technologies, new business models, and new values. And this is very important. And the, the, the thing I want to emphasize is you need to become an example. You need to read more. You need to try harder because as you do that, you are inspiring many others that are behind you. We committed when we buried Matthew Goniwe that they might kill you, but they will never kill your ideas. We committed to Matthew Goniwe that even though you are dead and buried, will carry your name to the ultimate end, where our children are treated as equal. I want to thank the family for giving us that name. And I want to assure you that I have a special place for this institution because it carries a special name. And that will never fail you. Gentlemen, we understand that time is of the essence and uh, that Re Le Sufi has been here enjoying each and every person that has come on stage, sharing their knowledge, the experiences of what we've enjoyed in terms of dance and just expression from the, from the young ladies, right? And so Kenale Makwa Lofa from the four, the MEC and the Premier, for, from the young girls, they have written down their details um, just for that contribution that we spoke of. So I will safely leave them here, right? Um, and I know that we've been asked by um, the CEO to just press on time and be considerate, but I wanted you to feel the embodiment of poetry that we have brought here tonight. Um, her name is Kush Mathega. She is a writer, a poet, and just an embodiment of art. Maybe kindly welcome her on stage. She will be doing one piece, just so I can extend on introducing this man. Like I said earlier, the longer the introduction, the more work. So maybe we're looking at a president's chair, I'm not sure. But uh, let's welcome Mr. Kush Mathega. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, I think sometimes when introducing certain people, less is more because they bring the more, right? Thank you very much, Kush. Now let's introduce the man, Mr. Banyaza Lesufi, Premier of Gauteng Province. He hails from Tembisa, Ekuruleni Metropolitan Municipality by the Apartheid authorities. He is a lifelong activist and was an active member in the Mass Democratic Movement. He was SRC president. president, you see where it starts. He was SRC president at the University of Natal, now known as KZN. He spent his early career working an NPC that promoted initiatives that focused on combating youth unemployment, like serving as, a, as an outreach manager at the Tembisa Career Center. He also served in a variety of community-based structures that found his political home, the African National Congress. He served at the local government in the establishment of the inaugural Ekuruleni Metropolitan Municipality. He later served at the youth, uh, at the South African, actually, security agency, Shasasa, and later the Department of Basic Education. He was appointed MEC for Education in the Gauteng province, where he served from 2014 to October 2022, and subsequently elected to serve as the Premier of Gauteng Province. He is well known for his love and passion for the football, right, amongst other things. Please help me welcome the Honorable Premier, Mr. Banyaza Lesufi. Thank you so much, Program Directors. Let me take this opportunity to thank you. I want to thank the credo for families uh, and all the representatives that are here. And further thank uh, uh, Professor Mary Metcalf. Thank you so much for the wonderful lectures. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to acknowledge uh, the MEC, uh, responsible for education and youth development in our province and further acknowledge all the boards that are here and the leadership of the department uh, with the new uh, HOD, uh, Tate Rufas, uh, welcome and thank you so much, uh, as well as the entire leadership of the Matthew Cornewa School of Leadership. Ladies and gentlemen, I prepared an input. I'll request it to be <laughs> distributed, if you don't mind. Uh, and if there was somebody that was assigned the task, uh, program directors, to do a vote of thanks, uh, please accept me that I hijack that and do it uh, on your behalf. I want to firstly thank the Matthew Konue family for allowing us to continue to use this name. And I want to thank the family for understanding that sometimes an honor reminds you of the pain that you come from. Uh, that in whatever that we do, we don't want to resuscitate the pain, uh, but want to reaffirm our affirmation, uh, reaffirm our affection, and reaffirm our commitment that the name Matthew Konew will never die. Uh, that our presence here 
is to thank the family for agreeing uh, that we use the name and we continue to use the name. I also want to thank the leadership of the institution, uh, the chairperson of the board, uh, 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 chair, I've seen you in all the lectures, uh, an indication that you are traveling this road with us openly and heartily, and that the commitment for you to lead all your board members that I'm seeing here, uh, it also is an indication that you, you, you share our fears, we share our aspiration, but most importantly, you share the path that you are taking. Thank the MEC himself. Uh, every day you are convincing me that we didn't make a mistake to appoint you to be the MEC responsible for this department. This department is big. <laughs> this department is massive. We need a young person that has the energy. I can see you're making a joke about my uh, looks foot uh, in 2014. Uh, I don't mind to keep your looks, I'll remind you in 2030 as well. Uh, well because this department needs somebody that has to be there all the time. Um, and I want to thank you and appreciate um, whatever that you are doing for us. I further want to thank all the institutions that have uh, combined their thoughts and their ideas, uh, Saibono, uh, Matthew Konew, School of Leadership, the department itself, uh, for all of you for agreeing to ensure that you observe and, and deal with this thing. And I always say, and I must uh, emphasize that point, that when you speak about Matthew Goniu and the Credit Four, uh, we'll always have mixed emotions. Uh, the sadness uh, part of it is that we remember people that have been killed for no apparent reason. We remember people that have their careers cut short at their prime. We remember people that have nothing, nothing except the love for our people and our country. Uh, and that pains us every time when we have to observe this. But we also have the positive, and that's what excites me, uh, that we can report to Matthew Gonew and the Credo Four that finally, finally, the final coffin to an apartheid education system has been nailed. That as I'm speaking to you now, the passing by our parliament of the basic education amendment laws, the Bella Bill, it was a signal that people's education is finally resting in our country. <laughs> but we can finally report to them that what they fought for and what they thought by assassinating them, they will stop it. They failed to stop it when that bill was overwhelmingly adopted in our parliament last month. A signal to say, language will no longer be a discriminatory tool, that our children, regardless of their background, they now have a full right to go to any school of their choice and be in any class of their choice without being discriminated because they speak a different language. That's the power that we wanted, and that's the power that we have now. And they can rest in peace knowingly that we'll implement that Bella Bill, and we must not turn back. You will be cowards, MECs. You will be cowards if you are a minister. You will be cowards if you are a principal. You will be a coward if you are an SGB, if we can implement that Bella Bill so that our children can be finally be free. Our message is very simple. They might have oppressed our forefathers. They might have oppressed our parents. They tried to oppress us, we defeated them but we'll never oppress our children and our children's children in future. We remain very strong. We remain very strong and very firm that regardless of the level of insult, non-racialism is the future and we'll defend it with whatever that it takes. Any person that does not want non-racialism, we will impose it on them because non-racialism is not bad. It's a good thing for our society. So we stand here to thank everyone that they've played that particular role.
But we want to extend that role, the leadership of Mephi Konyo School of Leadership. We want to extend that role. And you know what we have said to you, and I'm glad that even the MEC is emphasizing that particular point. Gone are the days where we'll teach our children how to praise a frog. Gone are our days where our children have to use a brick as a toy to play in our schools. We need teachers that have an impact, and we need teachers that will be like Matthew Gonew and all those that were part of the credo for. We need teachers that will understand the importance of the economy and teachers that will understand where we want to take education in our province. So Matthew Gonew School of Leadership must be prepared to be an institution that will produce new educators, educators of the future. It's extremely important and it's non-negotiable. The reason why we are arguing that particular point is that all teachers in this particular country are trained from the same institution. There is no university that prepares teachers for private school. There is no university that prepares teachers for former Model C school. There is no university that prepares teachers for township schools. All teachers are trained from the same port, but the outcomes are different when they are deployed in our institution. It must come to an end. If you are trained from the same port, the outcome must be the same. If we are all trained from the same port, the outcome must be the same. And therefore, Matthew Gonewe, you should be that first institution that will train teachers and all the teachers that are trained from Matthew Gonewe, the output must be the same, regardless of the school that we deploy them. And that's the new mission that we are giving you. That's the new task that we are giving you to go and establish that institution so that you can ensure that we finally bury whatever that is still remaining in our education system. And that goes, MEC Matome Chiluhan, that we can continue, all the children of this country, all of them, regardless of the color of the skin, you are speaking about the history uh, that they need to understand, and I support that. But it must be an important and a relevant history. It's very, very important. But all the children of this particular country, we must rise and say one thing and one thing only, MEC Madhuman. Every child in this country, as long as you are a South African, you must write one examination. This thing of IEB examination for the rich and another examination for the poor must come to an end. We must have one examination for all our children in our country. And we must not be scared. We must not be scared. I'm the children of Eric Wall. I'm the child of Chris Hani. I'm the child of Nelson Mandela. I'm the child of Winnie Matikizela Mandela. I know my name. I know my name. I know my name. We are not going to beg for our children to be free in their own country. We are not going to beg for our children. There is no reason why other children should write IEB. There is no reason other children must write the National Senior Certificate, but they will go to vets in the same lecture room, in the same university. Others have an example, and have a, a, others have an advantage because they write early, they get their results early, they apply early, they are taken early, and we have to come later. In our own country, it must not happen. We must remain firm. We must remain firm in our belief. Every South African must write the same examination to go to the same university. And if we fail to do that, we would have betrayed people like Matthew Gonewe. As we said, if you are a coward, don't count me. But if you are prepared to take the war and the battle forward, count me and I'll be at the forefront. Thank you so much. Truly appreciate it. Well, the gauntlet has fallen, right, Premier? 
Uh, there was a moment that we needed to drop the mic, right? <laughs> <laughs> the mic didn't drop this time around. Um, I have to say, though, Premier, um, uh, before I call on the, the head of the audit committee of um, the board, watching you and the MEC, for me, is such an interesting thing, because I remember the MEC when you were still a chairperson of uh, the Committee on Education in uh, the Gauteng Provincial Legislature, and you were still the MEC for Education. <laughs> And you had to account. <laughs> and you had to account and appear before him. And the questions, and Chris, you crisscross, 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 ask difficult questions and ask difficult questions. And sometimes I would invite the, well, back then it was the chairperson of, um, of the committee on the show when I was still at Power FM. And you will also be very critical, um, not scared at all. And to see you guys work together now um, in the manner that you're working together, for me, it's quite amazing. Um, also, as a young black man, watching this is incredible. So, well done to this relationship that you're building. I am now going to call on, I know, Premier, that you said the vote of thanks, but there's a vote of thanks of a vote of thanks. <laughs> I'm going to call on uh, Bonolo Ramukhele, who is the chair of the audit committee, to come and please give us the vote of thanks and then he will also be handing over a token of appreciation to our speakers. Uh, evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, what I'm about to do is called double counting in accounting. Uh, this work has already been done by Premier Andrek Lesufi. Uh, we must call him by his home affairs issued name. Um, my job is fairly simple uh, now that the leader of the province has uh, paved the path. It's just to, uh, number one, thank the family. Um, I think I've, I've worked in institutions of government and the private sector, but I've not seen an institution that takes a conscious effort to involve uh, the family uh, the way that uh, Matthew Goniwe uh, School of Leadership does. Uh, to thank the bishop and the family and the delegation uh, from Credoc, um, we actually do discuss uh, the family as a board. And one of the things that uh, we've initiated as a board of directors was to say that how do we preserve the name of Matthew Goniwe? How do we assist um, the family to preserve the name? And one of the work that is being undertaken at the behest of the board and management is to actually make sure that the name is trademarked and uh, it's got all the necessary patents that the family can then be able uh, to use the, the name globally so that no one can hijack uh, the name. We've seen it so many times that even something as simple as rooibos tea you wake up that it's now an American brand when it's a distinctly South African brand. Uh, you wake up that uh, the writings of Inok Sondonga are now owned by somebody sitting in America. So we're trying to avoid that when it comes to the name uh, of uh, Matthew Goniwe. Uh, we'd also like uh, to thank uh, the leadership of the province, uh, starting with our immediate boss. Uh, we're not going to start with the premier. We're going to start with our immediate boss. Uh, MEC of Education, uh, Madume Shilwane, and uh, we do echo the sentiments of the Premier that when we watch from afar and we look at the strides that uh, the MEC has taken, it is quite admirable. And for some of us where he has led us elsewhere in a certain youth formation, it's also good to see that our leaders are actually taking up the mantle of leading a, a society. Uh, David Makura once said uh, in one function I attended in 2014, and said, what a beautiful moment to see my generation running the country. Uh, we can say that uh, with the MEC of Education. Um, we'd also like to thank the Premier for making time. He was not actually uh, even, even if he didn't come, we would understand because he's busy. But I think it speaks again, Premier, when you say that you've got a special, this school has got a special uh, place in your heart. We thank you for your continued support. I uh, also like to thank my colleagues on the board under the capable leadership of uh, Mr. Lidimo. 
Um, also thank uh, management uh, led by the fresh from the box, uh, Sbu Matlangu, the brand new CEO of the institution. He has also taken uh, really the baton and ran with it. Um, and also to single out uh, Ms. Maloka, she's there. She was actually responsible uh, for putting together um, this particular uh, event. Um, lastly, to thank uh, yourselves uh, for making time. It's a Friday, uh, but you know, as, as, as Prof. Metcalf was speaking, I was taking notes. And I like these type of events because when you leave, you go buy books, uh, you go read, you go watch documentaries, and by the time Monday hits, you are much more smarter uh, than you were. You appreciate this country much more uh, than you did uh, before you actually came to these type of uh, forums. And um, I'd also, uh, as a parting shot, the issue of the institution of higher learning is probably one of the, the legacy uh, defining uh, achievements of this institution. And if we get it right, when we get it right, it's going to be one of the good stories uh, to tell uh, of this past administration. Uh, thank you very much. So is that moment for the photo op. Um, I'm going to please ask you to hand over the gift to the Premier. Uh, Premier, if you can please come and join us on stage. Can we then have the MEC coming on stage as well? We didn't make that commitment to the children. Yes, uh, in our court. Uh, Let's uh, not forget the children. Yes, yes. <laughs> Do you want to make it public? So, so I want to uh, 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 pledge uh, one rand above what he pledged. No, <laughs> 2,000 <laughs> 2001 rand, no. <laughs> It's heavy, it's heavy, it's heavy. We need transparency also to know what's in there. Um, and then we're going to call on Nyaniso. Nyaniso Koniwe, please come to the podium. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, once again, thank you so much for making time for us on this Friday evening to reflect on the life, the legacy of Matthew Koniwe, uh, Professor Mary Metcalf, we had to leave a bit earlier on. Um, in absentia, thank you so much for the contribution towards understanding the life of Matthew Koniwe, but also understanding it through pictures and visualizing it and um, also how the pictures and the visuals are able to touch us in different ways. To the family, once again, thank you so much. Um, as um, uh, Ubunolo has just indicated, also thank you so much for allowing us to use the name. Thank you so much for allowing us to use the name and may his spirit and his legacy continue to live on. Um, we will be serving late dinner. Um, if you walk up, you turn left, and you turn left again, that's where the dinner will be served, and um, also there are gifts that we will be giving you right at the door. Once again, to the organizers of this event, thank you so much, you guys have done well, and to the Matthew Goniwe School of Leadership and Governance, to the entire team, thank you so much. Have a beautiful night, and may the spirit of Matthew Goniwe continue to live on.